I wanted to bring today's episode to the podcast talking about electromagnetic frequency radiation, otherwise known as EMF, really how that can impact our fertility. So we all have cell phones. I think 93% of the uh, United States population have cell phones. So cell phones, Wi-Fi, your laptop, your your tablet, how that impacts our health. And specifically, we're digging into how it impacts female fertility and male fertility, talking about increased risk of miscarriage, how it impacts sperm, DNA fragmentation, really what you can do right now to minimize your risk. So excited for you to listen to this podcast episode. Definitely listen to this today with your partner and simple steps you can take right now to help. So thanks a lot and take care. Hey there. Thanks so much for listening to the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast. And I've got a favor to ask you if you are enjoying learning about the functional approach to fertility, consider going to iTunes and rating and reviewing the podcast. This is how it helps the show reach more people that are struggling with infertility, knowing that there's another approach that really can get to the bottom of why it's not working in the first place. So all you need to do is if you're on the app or the desktop, just go in and consider leaving a five-star rating and leave a review. And there is step-by-step instructions in the show notes showing you exactly how to do that. So if you can just take a few minutes, just take a few minutes right now, you can pause this, this recording, come back, leave the review. It would really mean the world to me and help others that are on the fertility journey as well. Take care. Hey there. I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. One theme that keeps coming up with the couples in our Fab Fertile Couples Coaching Program is sleep. Whether it's insomnia, having a hard time, falling asleep, waking up at night, or feeling tired when we wake up. Sleep is critical for fertility and hormones. And that's why I'm so excited to have Blue Blocks as our podcast sponsor. So we're exposed to blue and green light from our phones, our tablets, our computers, indoor lights, and more. And this exposure impacts our melatonin production. Melatonin is essential for both female and male fertility. It helps determine the frequency and duration of our cycle and impacts sperm. There's lots of blue light blocking glasses on the market, but the ones from Blue Blocks, they've actually compared other popular brands and Blue Blocks block 100% of blue and green light while other brands fall short. So I have their sleep glasses. They have red lenses and the ones I have are a little translucent uh, frame and they're so stylish and really cool. And so they eliminate 100% of the blue and green light in the 400 nanometer to 550 nanometer range. So this is exact range has been shown in clinical studies to disrupt melatonin and negatively impact your sleep. So all you do is wear your sleep glasses after sunset until it's time for bed and you'll notice improved sleep after just one use. And it's also cool to use when you're flying for managing jet lag. So I got to say, I was a little skeptical about the noticing uh, improvement after one use, but literally I did I use these glasses and my sleep is actually already pretty good. I use them for one day and I have to say after one day, I had the best sleep of my life. I just felt so rested. So these glasses, they ship free and they're tracked for all orders anywhere in the world. And also they have have all their frames come in prescription, non-prescription, and reading glasses. Plus, you can send in your frames and they'll add the blue light blocking and green light blocking lenses to your frame. So this is an easy hack that you can add to your fertility toolkit. All you do is go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com. Use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout and receive a 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U, B-L-O-X dot com and use the coupon code get pregnant podcast to receive your 15% discount. I didn't need to go to donor eggs. Obviously, mm-hmm. I don't regret it. I have beautiful children. I could have done things differently, restored. I was still cycling back in my in my 20s. I could have looked at my health, the environmental toxins, the stress I was under. Many, many women are being told their eggs are too old. That's often merely an assumption that's not based on actual evidence. The reason being that there is no direct test of egg quality. You can't test egg quality. 
It's the man who's got a food sensitivity or he has a zinc deficiency. Like there can be a root cause to these symptoms that are, you know, quote unquote, period problems that the doctor will pass you a pill without any question of why. And some part of you knows that if you can reframe your journey from not one of struggle, or if it is struggle, learn how to embrace the struggle. Learn how to embrace it. Most conditions in the child occur during the nine months of development. It's the, the genetic switches are turned on or turned off and they're pre-programmed. So you are in such a powerful, amazing position to do amazing things for your kids. You know, why is IVF the first step? Because we believe it should be the last step. Welcome to Get Pregnant Naturally, where functional medicine and natural fertility solutions will help you get pregnant and have your baby. Hey everyone, I'm Sarah Clark, the founder of Fat Fertile and your host. I believe the functional approach is the first step for anyone struggling with infertility, and my aim is to help you get pregnant naturally. Today, I'm welcoming Daniel Debon to the podcast, and we're digging into electromagnetic frequency, otherwise known as EMF radiation, and how this can impact your fertility. Daniel Debon is an internationally recognized expert in EMF radiation, EMF shielding, and EMF-related health issues, with special focus on the effect of exposure from mobile devices such as laptops tablets and cell phones. And he has had over 30 years of experience of engineering experience in the telecommunication industry, holding positions at AT AT&T and Bell Labs and SAIC. And he is the co-author of Radiation Nation, The Fallout of Modern Technology, which I really recommend you check out. So thanks so much for listening. I'm so thankful that you're here and make sure you hit subscribe. And if you know someone else who is on the fertility journey, please share this podcast with them. Hey, Daniel, excited to have you on the podcast. Uh, Sarah, thanks so much for inviting me. I, I really do appreciate giving, having the opportunity to chat a little bit about the subject I'm pretty passionate about. So thanks again, Sarah. Absolutely. Yeah. So if you could share your story as to how you came to do this work. It, it actually was interesting. About seven, eight years ago, I had my adult sons visiting on a holiday. My wife says that having that laptop on your lap can't be good for you. Mm. I want grandchildren. <laughs> So a tiny bit of history, I I ran the technical laboratories for the Bell system, and I was pretty familiar with electronics. And my point at that point was, no, there's no way that kind of energy level can bother the body. It's just impossible. So I did some research, and sure enough, back then, there was a lot of data, research data that said that roughly 20% of the male sperm is immobile immobile, immobilized uh, within three to four hours. So I was shocked because I was in the technology space for so many years. I I couldn't believe that, in fact, that kind of short duration of exposure could do that much potential damage or impact to the body. So that started me, well, I'll build you something to protect you because I was a mechanical engineer by trade. So I I designed some shielding materials for my sons. They use it, their friends liked it. And then we started building more and more and and that's evolved over the years. And, And as a side note, Sarah, I still don't have any grandchildren, and it's not because of the exposures to radiation. <laughs> yeah, it's it is interesting, right? As we all sit with our laptops on our lap, as they call them, laptops, and then wait a minute, and we'll and we'll get into this over the podcast, and that kind of that burning feeling that you that you you feel, and you're thinking, oh, is there is there anything something going on? And you're doing it day in and day out, and turns yeah. out there is. Yeah. So for us to dig to dig in today, everyone listening to this podcast is dealing with either female or male infertility. So really, why should someone be worried about EMFs or electromagnetic frequencies, um, frequency radiation, and why is this so important for fertility? Over the last uh, a dozen years or so, there's been more and more research by the medical community sort of deep diving and looking into is there or is there not a problem with exposures 
uh, to the devices that we now have every day on our bodies. It, Ten years ago, none of us had anything around us, so uh, there, there was not that density of these technologies. But today, it's all around us. Your cell phone has a Bluetooth transmitter, a Wi-Fi transmitter, and it has a cell tower transmitter. So there's three separate transmitters from your cell phone alone. And then you think about your tablets and your laptops and all the other devices we have around us, and all of a sudden, we are definitely being exposed. And so with the research, it's confirming that there is well understood biological impact. A, uh, a radio frequency signal, the, the stuff that comes off of our tablets and laptops and cell phones is, is called RF. It's also, by the way, a microwave signal. So where the microwave signal hits your uh, the meat that you're cooking in your microwave oven, for example, it heats up the water between the cells, oscillates the cells, and all of a sudden, voila, you have uh, cooked meat. Well, that's the same thing going on when you have a, a, these devices around our bodies. It's much, much lower power levels, but it is clearly influencing the cells as as a thermal emitting signal. But we now know from all the research going on uh, over the last 10 years that it's really more so of concern, the biologicals. Absolutely. Yeah. And so let's, let's dig into, so specifically, because you developed this for, well, that sounds like the impetus was for male fertility. So let's start, dig into male fertility and how that really impacts, well, there's a rectal dysfunction and other things. So what, what can you say about the studies on that with cell phone use? So, so what we know is that, that there's been many, many specific studies on male um, sperm count and mobility. Consistently, what has been found is that there is clear relationships between the transmitted signal and the, the impact of the cell, the, the sperm cell. And so what that means is we have a growing, growing population that is conceiving less and less because of the male. And so one of the reasons that's true, and it's, by the way, extreme, as you may know, in some areas of the country, um, it is halving the um, birth rate as a result of reduced sperm count. And oftentimes when you go to a fertility uh, a clinic, the first things they say is, where do you keep your cell phone? And that's why. It's, there's clear evidence that that kind of relationship exists. And it, it's, it's just not, uh, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but it's not just that it's impacting the sperm. Um, there are all so many other biological impacts that, to the body from that exposure uh, from a cell phone, um, things like uh, immune system suppression, and, and there's on and on and on. But to answer your question, we know f without any doubt that there is a direct link. Um, and, and, and so for the male, uh, the reason for reductions is oftentimes because they have a cell phone in their pants pocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which can be linked to rectal dysfunction. And then also, um, no, DNA fragmentation with, with Wi-Fi. Oh, you know oh yeah. About that? And, yeah. yeah I, I, let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, okay, so w when you talk about other impacts to the body, uh, you, were, you were referring to uh, physical responses. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's talk a little bit about that. We, we know there's uh, s s s uh, DNA damaged cells as a direct result of exposure. Mutated cells, those are in, a couple of years ago, there was a, a study by the federal government, by the way, the National Toxicity Program, which is part of the federal government. And they spent like $25,000. And what they found as a result, they were trying to prove in this epidemiology study that there was no direct link from cell phones uh, uh, with cancer. The reverse happened. What it, what it proved, statistically significant proof, that is, it's uh, it, it, the populations were large enough in the epidemiology study that there are confidence levels of 90, 95% that the results were legitimate. They found frontal lobe cancers and they found heart cancers. Increased elevated levels, which were inconsistent, which was beyond the norm uh, for the population. That was reinforced by uh, a study, Ramazani study out of Italy uh, a year or two later, uh, only a few years ago, and they came up with the same conclusions. So we, we have 
uh, now statistically significant studies that says that there are these direct links to to cancers and tumor and such. Um, but believe it or not, uh, Sarah, that's not what we're worried about so much. We're more worried about what we see in the neurological space, um, the physiological space. We, we know that uh, these uh, devices are influencing the, the, the way in which the brain operates, the way in which we see the way in which we sleep, our immune system, as I mentioned before. So there's so many different ways we now know that is actually our bodies are being influenced by, by these devices around us today. Absolutely. Yeah. Cancer, as you said. Now, did you say heart cancer? Yeah. Believe yeah, it or not, yeah, all of us were really in your book. Yeah. Yeah. We were surprised at that, actually, because no one, none of us really knew at that time that there was that kind of linkage. Hmm. Yeah. So decreased sperm uh, mo uh, mobility. Uh, viability, DNA fragmentation, also increase a six time increase uh, in miscarriage and with cell phone use and early puberty in um, children. Anything you want to share about that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to ramble a little bit about this because there's a, there's a variety of different studies that we know about that sort of link uh, RF, radio frequency emissions, to particularly infertility. Inf inf um, when I actually did the study on the men and found the male sperm count was like 20% after uh, three to four hours, I also found a study in Italy that talked about females. And they, they, they found that 2% of the females had tumor, a uh, non-cancerous tumor by and large, uh, in the groin area. And then uh, of that, a small portion became t uh, cancerous. So we already had pretty significant data then that there was a direct link there. But fast forward to today, only a few years ago, uh, there was a, uh, a doctor out in uh, uh, San Francisco. And what he did was he gave a bunch of women who were in their first trimester meters. And he said, you know, keep keep an eye out of the elevation levels that, of exposure you have uh, when you travel around. And what he found was after the study, the study results found that after about, with high levels of exposure, that is uh, RF levels above uh, 0.5 watts, um, they found that they were three times more likely to have a miscarriage. Mm. So that was uh, quite interesting. And, and then, of course, uh, we have uh, researchers talking about what happens when you have a cell phone. And I actually wrote it in National Radiation Nation that when you have a cell phone in your uh, pants, you can damage the cell of um, an egg of a female. There are some that say that kind of influence to the cells of the egg can become part of the child she conceives 10 years from the from now from the place from the damage, and it could be a mutated cell that becomes a a part of the subtending generations, mm -hmm. and so there is this concern that with all these technologies having that deep level of influence, um, there could be an increasing um, uh, level of infertility um, on the woman's side, not just the male because of the well, but now the woman. When I wrote the book, by the way, there was a Dr. Prasad. He's a, a he's a one of the uh, well, one of the first and one of the finest radiologists in the in the country. And he told me that he didn't believe that that could be true. And I and I said, well, the facts seem to suggest that. And I'm just sharing that information with you. And then he had a patient. Uh, a, a young woman, early 20s, uh, had technology around her everywhere she went. And um, she conceived and had a child that unfortunately passed away and very weird kind of DNA. Uh, so obscure that they couldn't explain how that could have been done. And then he then, then he called me and suggested there may be a case here that I've actually seen a young woman exposed to these kinds of things have a, a miscarriage as a result, or not a miscarriage, a born child, a stillborn child. Mm. So it's pretty serious stuff, Sarah. Yeah, absolutely. And with, it's interesting with our, the fertility clinics on the rise. So in 1985, there was, there was 44 clinics in the States, and now in 2015, there's 440 so yeah. infertility is on the rise. It used to be 60% female, 40% male, and now we're seeing more 50-50 and yep. with sperm rates going down because of all this toxicity that we as humans are exposed to. And yeah, EMFs is only, is only one of the things, but you know, equally as important as your herbicides and the pesticides and 
and all the other things that were in the middle of this huge food experiment too. <laughs> yeah, Sarah, what, what's interesting about that comment, and I absolutely agree with everything you just said, uh, what's very interesting is it's only becoming fairly very recently believed that the ambient in our environment, the, the electromagnetic radiation within our environment um, is clearly linked to fertility, infertility. And and so that is growing. When you hear about environment we live in and the toxicity of, of the elements within it, um, this is now becoming more and more prominent. In fact, there are actually clinics evolving not just on that side, but dealing with the physiological stuff going on as well. Mm -hmm. And we will talk a little bit about that. But absolutely, I agree that um, we, we know that there are new classes of uh, health education that's evolving, that's trying to address what we're seeing in the body as a response to these exposures. So to help the uh, your listening audience, uh, Sarah, let's talk a tiny bit about what those sources could be. Mm -hmm. we, we talked a little bit about um, your cell phone, your Wi-Fi, your laptop, um, but also it's the wiring in your room that could potentially be admitting into your environment. When you have a alternating current uh, in a household, and you have a current flow, you have a light bulb on, the wires in your house actually emit electromagnetic radiation. So that's ex called extremely low frequency stuff, extremely low frequency radiation. The power lines in, uh, in front of your house, they generate that. And so you have that one source been around quite some time, and now you have this new source, which has only been over the last 10 years predominating our environment. So uh, I, I think it's the combination of all these things. You're a hairdryer. That, yeah, I saw that in your book, and I was like, oh. yeah, yeah. It like it, it generates like 150 milligauss. A milligauss is just a measure. It's a bunt, you know, as opposed to a screen on uh, that you you look at with your computer. That that's 10 milligauss, 15 milligauss. But when you have these kinds of exposures prolonged, it really does take an impact. Uh, can impact your body. Yeah, and then electric blankets, microwave ovens, which I think we all know about that that one, yep. but maybe some of us are still using microwave ovens. Um, alarm clocks, which I thought was interesting. Yes. <laughs> My husband had this like old school alarm clock and um, yeah. <laughs> what the heck? Well, you know, it, it's funny and maybe I, I'm jumping, but those exposures, they clearly are real. When you deal in these environments, you have to be aware of the, this environment and and, and and things you can do to help improve that environment so it's less impacting your your, your health. Um, and, and so when we were, we were talking about, I mentioned early on that we'll talk a little bit in detail of other functions, like sleeping. When you sleep in a bedroom, it, it, you know, th there is a, a series of things you need to be worried about when you do those kinds of things. Your body uh, recovers uh, um, at night when you sleep so you can perform during the day. So anything that disrupts that circadian rhythm is something that may impact your health. And so when you're looking at a monitor, a uh, tablet, before you go to bed, you're reading, there's a blue light that comes off of the LEDs on those things. And they actually influence the melatonin. Uh, there's a um, protein under the eye. Uh, I forget what the name of it is. There's a protein. It's I call it the uh, the switch, the mitochondria, not mitochondria, but the melatonin switch. And if if you if you're reading at night within two hours of your sleep, your melatonin's been hampered and the switch hasn't turned on, you have a little bit of time falling hard to fall asleep. So you got to be careful of the visible light. Um, as potentially influence you, as well as, as you mentioned, the, the, the clocks. If you have a clock that's a foot away from you, the, the emissions from that is influencing your head. If you have it four inches, a four foot away, it won't. So you really want to try to push it out as far as you can. And you certainly don't want cell phones. You certainly don't want your tablets near you when you sleep. These body responses are uh, from head to toe. Not just the womb, not just the uh, male's uh, fidelity. Um, it's it's also other body functions that you got to be careful about as well. Yeah, the whole body. And yeah, we've done a number of podcast episodes on blue light and really how that blue and green light, how that impacts your melatonin, which is essential for both male and female fertility. Yeah. And the sponsor of yeah. our podcast is, is, is Blue Block. So looking at those blue light blocking glasses, and they have some really cute ones out there right now. 
And it's yeah. interesting, interesting with that getting Google Home or Alexa, and you know, have that thing and you have it. I had mine for a while, dumb, dumb, beside, beside, yeah. like, beside my bed on my, on my night table. And I'm like, yeah. turning the lights off and all that stuff. I'm like, what am I doing? So I moved that and that, yeah, we work with couples for months on, on sleep hygiene and taking right. the phone out the room or at least putting it on flight mode. Um, yes. Sarah, I had a, I had a, I was on a podcast uh, with a really, really bright lady. I talked about the sanctuary, uh, sanctuary, uh, uh, the bedroom sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And she was being very polite to me. And I was telling her what she should be careful about, what she should do. And um, about two weeks later, I, I found out, she called me up and said, you know, I didn't believe you. <laughs> and and my husband and I took our cell phones out of the bedroom as well as moved all the devices around us. And we're now sleeping at night. <laughs> so hey, go figure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like you don't think of because you can't see it, right? You can't feel it necessarily. You don't really realize it is influencing your body. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And let's just talk about how it, so for preconception health and pregnancy, how it impacts children in, in utero. You could talk a little bit about that. Some, some yes. Stuff. Yeah, that was um, Dr. Powell's work. Um, it, it, the the argument about subtending generations being impacted because of mutated cells, mm -hmm. there is an argument that it starts in the womb. So when you have a cell phone in your pocket and it's influenced this, the egg, you have that, that impact. But that's not the only thing you're concerned about. There is influences to the developing fetus. The uh, autism is in vitro, believed in vitro early on, and it continues towards an adult. So the, that that group is more concerned or, or getting more concerned about those e exposures because there's evidence that links that. And as a child, we have, you know, when you when when I grew up, of course, cell phones weren't they didn't exist. Um, maybe they began in when you uh, were growing up. But today's children have exposures by six years old, mm -hmm. and and if you think about it, the influence to the neurological and uh, physiological begins now at six years old because children are getting cell phones. So, so we know that there's direct links to ADHD and other kinds of impacted um, neurological uh, issues that are occurring. And in the classroom, like 15 years ago, there was no transmission in the room. And all of a sudden now, the, the entire room's filled with transmitters uh, because of the Wi-Fi access they have for the classwork. Um, so it starts in vitro and it continues to an adult. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it was a three, a three times higher risk of developing asthma and then- Yeah, exactly, risk. all that stuff, yeah, exactly. Uh, weight, uh, weight and ob uh, increased uh, risk of weight and obesity. Yes, all of those things have been contributed. I haven't gone through the laundry list of all the kinds of direct linked uh, um, uh, body responses to the to this emission, but there are many, many, many. It's really something that is uh, changing um, behavior. I'll, I'll give you what I have. Well, you haven't talked about this at all, but a, a cell phone generates 1.6 watts per kilogram. That's not much energy, uh, but when it's directly to your head, it's a lot of energy that's penetrating into your frontal lobe. Just as a statistic over the, of the 10 year period, the last 10 year period, uh, uh, frontal lobe cancers grew uh, by 2% per year, compounding every year. Is that directly linked to cell phone use or not? Um, some think it is, uh, others are skeptical, but, but I certainly think it is. But the impact to the frontal lobe with kids is even more concerning because that 1.6 watts per kilogram goes into a male, six foot male by one to two inches and heats it up by two degrees. That same signal goes completely through a six-year-old child's head and it heats it up. And as I said before, the bigger problem is the biological impacts, not so much the, uh, the cancers it may cause. And of course, the thermal, we don't care too much about it heating up because there's long-term problems that are associated more with the biological impacts, not the thermal. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some of the physical symptoms. So what would someone experience if they so, have EMF exposure, which could be, there's a myriad of symptoms. Yeah, there's so many of them, right? It, yeah. It's like, so you have tingling in your hands. You, you may um, have your eyes hurt a bit. Um, you, you have tendonitis. You're, you're, uh, you hear ringing in your ears. Mm. Headaches. 
insomnia. Um, you may feel fatigued, drowsy or, or nauseous. Th those are directly linked. Depression and anxiety, stress, irritability, uh, burning sensations, allergy-like symptoms. Um, what's interesting, by the way, is I work with neuro uh, neurologists and, and they talk about the concussion-like symptoms. Uh, so all the kinds of things you'd expect to see uh, from a concussed patient, you see with those who are electrohypersensitive. So um, the list goes on and on uh, from sleeping disorders, memory problems, uh, concentration, eye strain, vision problems, uh, to the more chronic diseases. Yeah. And the ones that are more sensitive, are, you know, are they the canary in the coal mine kind of where the rest of us are may not notice that, but others definitely, if they're near any of this are noticing some of those symptoms. Yeah, uh, 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 Shao, great, great point. Let's talk about that a little bit. There's data now that says 20% of us are electro hypersensitive, 20%. Now that is the, where the canaries in the coal mine. We, we feel it and it disrupts us. And you can, you, you know, when you enter a room that there's something there uh, that you wish was not. Out of those 20%, 80% of them are women. Like what's going on? We we really don't know. We don't know if it's a zinc, uh, a copper disruption. We don't know if it's the the way the brain works. We we really don't know why. But there's no doubt that there's become an increase in electric hypersensitive EHS. They call it. And what about so? If you talk about the difference between 4G and 5G, obviously right now I think you know we're recording this in April 2020. So uh, with the 5G rollout, and then then you're hearing some news. Well, not mainstream news, but other news channels talking about 5G and the correlation with COVID not being the cause, but is it the fact that we're now exposed to more toxicity? Is it, does that then, you know, have people getting sicker and, and, and their immune systems being suppressed? But before we get into that, so really the, the 4G and the 5G, what's the difference and why is everyone excited and, and some of us don't want 5G? Okay. Um, Let's talk about that. But you, you touched on something I don't want to forget about. It's immune suppression. Immune suppression is largely driven by the gut. We know for sure 4G and less helps propagate the bacteria and virus in the gut. So there's no question at all that we know from our research that there are links to immune and gut. Uh, given I said that, Let's talk about the difference between 4G and 5G. 4G is, it's roughly two, th there's a frequency, and we haven't spoke much about this, but there's a frequency rate, which is, uh, when I talk about um, extreme low frequency stuff, that's at 60 hertz. It's very, very slow. Uh, it's a wave in the air that's very slow and very long. Um, when you talk about four, up to 4G, you're talking about a wave that's much shorter now and it's um, it's operating at roughly uh, roughly one to two gigahertz one to two gigahertz means it's one to two billion cycles per second with 5g believe it or not much of what you're hearing about is about the uh, one to two gigahertz range the real concern with 5g is when they go to the nanometer that is the 20 to 90 gigahertz. It's much, much, much faster. Mm -hmm. And and so most of what you hear about today, when you hear about Sprint announcing 5G, when you hear about AT&T announcing 5G, all of these rates are very well understood rates and have been around for a long time. 600 megahertz is, is roughly AM, AM radio. Mm -hmm. It's the spectrum's been opened up for cell phone use. 2.4 gigahertz is the Wi-Fi range. That Wi-Fi range has now been opened up for mic, uh, for mobile service as well. Which So there are a lot of parts of the spectrum that are now being used by 5G that has historically been populated with services. It's now micro, uh, um, it's now uh, mobile services. Um, the stuff that's really, really concerning to, uh, and where there's the linkage is up at the 20 to 90 gigahertz range. Um, that's much, much fa faster. And that's the stuff uh, associated with what you was referred to as small cell sites. Those are the little, little sites that are going to be in front of your house and it can only transmit 750 feet. By and large, that's, it's been field trialed, but they're not 
generally available uh, to the population. Those are the ones that they're talking about the real concern because it's so different than the current uh, RF signals. And so when you link Corona uh, virus to 5G, there's absolutely no question whatsoever. There is none. Absolutely none. Let me give you an example. If if you had said to me that there was leukemia, um, more leukemia we observed, I would say, boy, that makes sense because I know through research that there was a thousand watt transmitter at 600 gigahertz that was worldwide. And anybody within five to six miles got leukemia. Three times more likely to, no, five times more likely to get leukemia. We do know that there are direct impacts, but one of them certainly is not impacting, stimulating the body to create an environment that in, invents a virus or propagates an environment, a, a, a virus to grow. So, Everything people are hearing is is really not based on research or science. Um, it's more of a, a miscalculated um, direction of those who are sharing the, the, the work. When, when I talked about the impact to the immune suppression, I've heard arguments relating that process uh, to a corona, uh, I mean, to a, a 5G signal. And there is none. Uh, I know that from one research study at 20 gigahertz that there is in, uh, accelerated propagation of gut and virus just like 4G, but it doesn't change it to something far beyond what we currently know. So these linkages, um, they're, they're, they're not based on fact, they're not based on science, and a lot of th people are talking about it in the context of a small cell site, which doesn't really exist in the marketplace yet. It's being rolled out. So um, you can be safe when you knowing that there is no linkage uh, to this. It does not uh, generate it. It does not create it. It does not accelerate it. But the 4G and 5G studies do say that it impacts the the health of our the bacteria in our gut, the health of our gut. Right, Sarah. That there there is no question about. We know that these things occur. Right, uh, and if you were to ask me. If I think it's going to be worse to the gut, I'd say probably not any worse than it is today. It could be. When when I talk about the small cell site, um, we haven't talked about it. There's yeah, so things. what exactly? So like, if someone was looking, you know, if we look out in the distance, we see a tower, like what what are we looking for with a small cell? Like if you can talk to it. It's very easy if it's in front of your house. These signals can only go 750 feet. Okay. So it's it's simple. If it's in front of your house, then worry, <laughs> right? That that as simple as that. It, it's very simple. And what they're doing there, because the 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 frequency rate is so high or much higher, it can't go very far. So they start trans with a cell tower. You have uh, the cell tower transmits at sixty watts, and it can go like three to five miles. A cell signal. You have a small cell site in front of your house, that's at 20 watts. So 20 watts can't go, can't go any more than 750 feet. So what they do to try to get that service to you, they, they send two signals to the cell phone and they direct those two signals directly to the cell phone. Is that a problem? I think so. I, I think we know from current uh, research that there are neurological impacts there, 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 and it goes from neurological to cancers. Uh, will we see more of the same? Probably. I don't think it's going to be less. It may be more, but we really don't know because no one's done any research on this work, as, as you may know, Sarah. Uh, there's been no study work whatsoever on 5G at all. So we really are speculating at most what's the impact of the body. But because they're using beaming and multi-in, multi-out technologies, I would expect to see, a, a, I would predict it would be worse than better. Worse than better, yeah. And so why are the current safety standards uh, not sufficient? Oh, very easy to answer that. Um, remember we talked about the thermal versus um, biological a little while ago? Well, the FCC um, in 96 
took of six foot males in the army and they characterized the physical characteristics of the brain or the, the head of a male. And when I mentioned that it goes two inches and doesn't heat up more than two degrees, was based on a six foot male. And as you would expect, that represented about 3% of the population. You have all the smaller people, you have children, you have women, everyone has a different physical makeup. And so the other 97% really weren't very well represented in the standard. And that standard only warred about two degree increase. They were not, there were no studies whatsoever on what's the biological impacts would be. And so we've been, that's the prevailing standard today, and it hasn't changed. It recently was debated by the FCC, and the FCC decided they're not going to change the standard. They feel it's acceptable. Even though I just talked to you about the MIMO, the 20 to uh, 90 gigahertz, uh, that has is not been in the spectrum before, um, but they chose not to look for data on by any research groups or research it themselves. What's happening in the marketplace, by the way, uh, Sarah, uh, you know, Kennedy Jr., he bumped into a friend of mine and they were, they were talking about this very subject. The next thing I found out is uh, like two months later, he, he's suing the FCC for ignoring what is the obvious in research. And so we now see a couple of suits against the FCC about the subject and the fact that they never did update based on more recent study work in science. So the moral of the story is um, you're the architect of your own destiny. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going to expect someone else to make sure you're safe, that's not going to happen necessarily anytime soon. You have to take the actions to ensure that the safety of you and your family. So we're going to talk about how do we protect ourselves. But first, before that, how do we go from, because this is some of the, some scary stuff we just talked about, like damn scary stuff. So how do we go from awareness versus fear? You know, that's interesting. I don't fear it at all. The reality of it is, Sarah, you and I are not going to take a a, a, a jet a, a, or, excuse me, a rocket to the moon to get away from all this stuff. Um, and that it is going to be in our environment and it will continue being in our environment. And, and um, what's being introduced, um, the body is not too familiar how to deal with it. It's evolving and hopefully we'll continue to learn and have a endurance, a built-in endurance with these emissions uh, that will evolve. But um, in the meantime, you, you have to find ways of protecting yourself. Right. Uh, so take it into your own hands. So let's It's in your own hands. Mm -hmm. Right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about some ways that we can protect ourselves with shields. This is obviously your company where you specialize in this. So um, talk about the, the different kinds of products we have that can, can help us for with the cell phone, with Wi-Fi, all of these things that are impacting our body. I'm going to first start off by saying you need none of those products. Um, if you are diligent about the time and distance of these devices, you're pretty safe. Um, for example, time. If you use a cell phone for a few minutes and you put it down, you're pretty safe. If you use a cell phone for 30 minutes and you're using it on speaker mode or you have it with your earbuds, mm -hmm. you're pretty fine. The, these exposures are not necessarily damaging you in any way. So simply by watching where you, how you're using the device and the duration of time you're using the device, um, you can remain pretty safe. If you have a cell phone to your head, um, that's the, the, the most endangering uh, spot to be. If you move it by one to two foot away, 80% of the danger is gone. By four foot, 98% of the danger is gone. So the moral of the story is you don't ever put a cell phone in the back of a, a stroller with your kids, you always keep it at least four foot away from the child. Um, and in most cases, you should be able to put, put it 10 feet away and still answer the phone if, if you want to keep it on. 10 foot away? I'm just doing my arm out here because really on speakerphone, you're basically, you get it at arm's length, which one? Yeah. A long arm because I'm six foot, but. but yeah. Um, you're, you're pretty safe. Uh, okay. It's not about panic. It's mm. about just, and this is a good way to remember it. Uh, uh, think of it as, uh, a, a, a B. One B, uh, one B can't kill you, a thousand will. You got to think about every transmitter in your room and eliminate it if you don't need it. For example, a, a, um, a, a cell phone. Do you use Bluetooth and Wi-Fi 
Probably not most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I certainly don't. So I turn them off. I don't need it. I don't need that. those three Bs. I only need one B. When you have uh, a, a laptop, you run an Ethernet cord, uh, physically put it a wire. You don't need the Wi-Fi. You eliminate that uh, transmitter, that B in the room. If, if, if you have a, a mouse and, and uh, it's in Bluetooth, get rid of it. Use a wired connection to your computer for your mouse. All of a sudden, that bee is eliminated. So it's a matter of trying to figure out where these bees are in the room and turning them off or re rewiring them so they're not transmitting in the room. Just that practice itself really can help uh, minimize exposures and to pretty safe levels. Yeah, so don't don't put the phone to the ear. Keep it on speakerphone. Don't, obviously, for a while there, this is years ago, I don't see women doing this anymore. They were storing them, the, the phones in their bras, which... Oh, my gosh, uh, yeah. You know, it's interesting then with breast cancer. But, but Sarah, you can't have kids put uh, uh, cell phones in their back pocket, pants pocket, mm -hmm. for, for the reasons we spoke about before. That's a very simple thing to be careful of, very easy to fix, and it really has potentially some serious negative stuff in the time. That's where you control your own environment, and if you're cautious enough, you can make it pretty safe. Giving your tablet to your son or daughter as a play device to preoccupy them is, is fine, but make sure the Wi-Fi is not on. Um, can, can, they, can they use games and things without having the Wi-Fi on? Uh, eliminating that Wi-Fi uh, really does keep them more protected and if you think about it, you do want to have the blue, uh, the blue uh, blocking glasses, as you mentioned before, because with a child, it, it can cause uh, premature macular degeneration. Not only is it mucking around with the uh, protein, the uh, cryptochrome protein that's in the eye, it's also drying the eye. Uh, I'll tell you a story. I had a, a, a physician I was working with, and he was telling me about one of the, his coworkers had been getting dry, uh, dry eye drops for uh, for for a couple of years. And I said, are you sure it's like, do you know the source of why it's dry? Because I knew from research that there's evidence that shows it's direct link. I, I sent her a pair of glasses and I said, try the glasses, see what happens. Her eyes were always bloodshot and dry for five, 10 years. Within two hours, it was gone. Yeah. It's, so it's a simple little thing to do, and it does have a some with sometimes pretty profound benefits. What about any with like the kill switches for Wi-Fi and anything there to? Oh yeah, well, well, no question about it. Your Wi-Fi should be at least ten foot away from you if you're using it during the day. You really don't want it any close to you for any prolonged periods of time. Okay. At it's night, right under the desk. Okay. <laughs> oh, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Uh, get rid of it. You do not want that there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. And, and and go go get a ten dollar timer and turn it off at night when you go to bed automatically. And then it'll turn on during the day when you need it. With with the Wi Fi, you go to the father's closet in your whole house and put it there. And it will still serve the whole house and you'll be more safe. And by the way, there's six watts being generated around your legs, by the way, <laughs> which okay. which is a lot of a lot of power mm -hmm. levels that, mm -hmm. that you want and to be. We able have two because I have one for my business, so I've got one up here and then one downstairs. <laughs> and my son, who's like up all night because he's a teenager, if I turned it on, yeah. he'd probably lose his mind. But um, <laughs> right, yeah. So you so you do actually have there's blankets and shields and you just talk. Oh about well, this yeah, well, stuff? well, yeah. So what ha had happened, right? I, I I built something for my my sons, and then I was. Um, reading an article about a, a, a parents who bought a six-year-old child a cell phone, a very healthy young lady. Um, and within a year, she had frontal lobe cancer and passed away. Um, and it was like, for me, it was fairly dramatic because uh, I came to, uh, I was thinking, I know I can s stop that signal from going into her frontal lobe. And if she had used something like that, she'd have been safe. And so that prompted me to push and design cell phone cases. And of course, that led to tablet, laptop, uh, all sorts of different packaging that is designed to protect the body from stuff we put close to our body. And then, of course, I, as I mentioned before, when you have earbuds, that's much better than when having your phone. But it's not perfect. Mm -hmm. I built earbuds that convert 
the electrical energy into a tube and have acoustical links to the ear. And so I eliminated it completely with, uh, with uh, our earbuds. With blankets, uh, we, uh, we really wanted to build blankets for, uh, for pregnant women uh, because we wanted to try to protect the womb. Uh, for, for the reasons we spoke about. And um, so we began blankets. And it turns out electric hypersensitive can put it around them and they feel more calm. So all of a sudden we have this new group of people that are not just looking for protecting the womb, but protecting the body mm -hmm. from our, our blankets. Use, um, them, use them on planes too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's what they, they, they actually, it's like they, they get glasses. They get. Uh, they they use it on uh, uh, yeah. on blankets and and the the eyes to me is far more important than just sleep. Uh, it turns out that um, when there's the eye connects to other stuff that's being controlled, balance, hearing, all of that's in the common area of control. And so the clinics we work with are, are, are noticing the more direct links. And when they fix one problem, they actually begin benefiting other problems that they have because now they're being cautious with either uh, shielding or, or distance, uh, whatever they're using uh, to protect themselves. So I actually think the eye stuff is far more important than just the switch, the, uh, the cryptochrome switch turning your melatonin on and off. Mm -hmm, I agree. And you also have, there's little um, shields for, um, they can wear too for pregnant women made of bamboo. We have pouches that um, actually women love. Um, they're pretty well designed, uh, current design pouch. Um, we have uh, security pouches because we're we know how to shield the uh, signals. Um, we had uh, some customers that were traveling, getting their data stolen. So we built a, d a device that prevents any anybody getting into the device or any of the device data getting out. So it's nothing in, nothing out. Uh, that's our uh, conceal shield. Um, so we keep on building a whole lot of products to try to help protect the body. But Sarah, one of the things I would really encourage, if, if anything, is the book. Read our book, Radiation Nation, because what I tried to do is I tried to sort of give an unbiased view of what research knows. I tried to give a view of what... Um, uh, w things you can do, and a little bit about the politics of this controversial question about electromagnetic radiation exposures. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, definitely check out the book. I read it, and it's great. It's got some really good, um, easy tips in there. And yeah, it takes it from that awareness versus the fear where you go down the rabbit hole and can you know stay in a bunker somewhere. Right. Exactly. <laughs> it's just not. And, and Sarah, you're not going to throw your cell phone away, right? I'm not. But you know what? I never used a cell phone close to me um, until we had the shielding that we uh, developed. And now I, I have no problem to put it right to my head because I know I'm shielded. Mm. Um, but before, I wouldn't put it even close to me. Um, so, yeah, you want to uh, – you need to think about modifying behavior uh, when using this modern technology because there is a debate of impact. And some think it's serious, some think it's not. Uh, I personally think it is. Mm -hmm. And the I, I, impact goes I, I, it was like I, I heard a biochemist say that there was no problems with this stuff. And I, I'm not a biochemist. I'm a mechanical engineer. And I saw sufficient evidence to clearly state a direct link. And she was saying there was none to the cell. I know the breakdown of a cell. It, you know, the uh, the um, calcium penetrates the, the cell. It, um Oxide builds up. That's what mutates the cell. I mean, it's very clearly understood the process of breakdown of the cell. Um, and for biochemists to say there's nothing means they did not read research. So if anybody suggests there's no problems, I'd suggest reading the study work that clearly shows direct links. Absolutely. And so you're offering 20% off of Defender Shield products and they use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast and they go to, uh, can you give me the, um, the your, your website, Defender Shield? Uh, it's DefenderShield.com um, and uh, DefenderShield.com has not only products, but um, as you may know, Sarah, we have a section, a learning section that we actually break down all the impacts to the body and link it to research studies. Uh, we also have a discussion on 5G. So by reading it, you'll have a better understanding what it is and what it's not. Excellent. So 
we try to provide education as well as products for safety. Perfect. Great. So definitely check out Defender Shield and receive your 20% discount. Use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast. And yeah, thanks so much for coming on and, and sharing your words of wisdom on this topic. It's really important, especially for people that are on the fertility journey and yeah. um, learning simple things that we you know that we can do right now that can have a major impact on our children and our, our future generations. So thank you so much for all the work you're doing. Sarah, again, thank you so much for inviting me. I do appreciate it. And I, I, I certainly appreciate you taking an action to try to help uh, share knowledge with your uh, listening base. I appreciate it. Thank you. Melatonin is important for female fertility. It helps regulate hormones and maintain the body's circadian rhythms. Plus, it helps determine the frequency and duration of the menstrual cycle. Plus, it impacts sperm count and motility. Blue and green light negatively impact our melatonin production. That's why we recommend blue blocks, blue and green light sleep classes to all our one-to-one clients. Simply go to blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get pregnant podcast at checkout to receive your 15% discount. That's blueblocks, B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com and use the coupon code Get Pregnant Podcast. Hey there, I regularly speak with five to 10 couples per week who are struggling to have their baby. And although we want to help everyone, we only have two spots available per month to work with us. So the Supercharger Fertility Discovery Call is for action takers, and really people who are ready to move forward so they can finally have their baby. And if you're not ready and you wait, the risk is you'll need to wait two to three months for a spot to open up. So if you're seriously considering working with us, go to fabfertile, F-A-B, fertile.com and click on book a free call. Call. Then you'll be all booked in and ready to spend 30 minutes to give you the action plan to getting pregnant naturally. That's fabfertile, F-A-B-fertile.com and click on book a free call. The Get Pregnant Naturally podcast, including show notes and links, provides information with respect to healthy living, nutrition, lab testing, and is intended for informational purposes only. The information provided is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment, nor is it to be construed as such. We cannot guarantee that the information provided on the Get Pregnant Naturally podcast reflects the most up-to-date medical research. Information is provided without representation or warranties of any kind. Please consult a qualified physician for medical advice and always seek the advice of a qualified health care provider with any questions you may have regarding your health and nutrition program.